How is everybody? Up, How are you? Good to you see you. Up, bro? Not see gonna be, you brother. No fights and confrontations happening. <laughs> no, right? man. I ain't know what's happening. You know? no, I, I, like, I thought I was the only one that went to parties and got fights. This is, this you, is be, you be around the drama now, don't that? Like, <laughs> I, I didn't have no drama that day. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't what was expected. You no. Know I mean? When you're feeling pressure, you uh, know, you got to turn that pressure up a little I bit. I ain't mad. You Keep know? that foot on their neck. I ain't mad. Trust Take me, it's the story of my life. Look, see, he's stunt. I got his number. Jason, you yeah, got me. Bro, you got everybody number. Number. Hey, I do. Humble stunt. Just yeah. Like, yeah, you know. Right? <laughs> Somebody go take his phone one day. Me. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, hey, look, look. Me. This is like, ain't no easy win, Jason. Yeah, nah, nah. Hold up. Limitless. Take a stomach cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless. Take a stomach cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, Way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, on the mission, got me up. Uh, Man, welcome to the pivot. Uh, we've been trying to work on this for a second. Freddie T, Chan, I'm RC. Thank you to our partners. Well, I'm going to knock one open. It's early in the morning. I got my own box. Can it's we get a, it right a, this time? I'm going ro to roll it. Here we go. It's too early for Jason. Nah. He, he probably got to <laughs> write nah, some story. Then, yeah, I, I was drinking yesterday. I'm actually trying to drink less. That's good. Yeah, for me. When you drink, though, do you put out more stories then or less? No, when I drink, let's see, we go, we get in five. I mean, it's, it, can, it, it depends. You know, I'm not an angry drunk, but I'm also not always a happy drunk. So I just never really know what's going to happen. It's just, it can be, it can be a lot. So it's whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Depending on who's in the room. You know, I follow the energy. If the energy's great, we have a great time. But if that energy ain't right, it can be really bad. Yeah, man. Also, to DraftKings, we appreciate your sponsorships. Everybody download DraftKings Sportsbook on your mobile devices. I want to get into something because you're talking about energy. And I've been around you a couple of times. The energy's always great, always polite, always cordial. Seem like have a good time, but that's not where your story starts. You know, to get to a point to say, God must have forgotten about me, you have to go through some things. And I've seen different pieces of what you said about your childhood. How did going through those things, whether it's foster care, dealing with the demons your mother had, not necessarily having a father figure, how has that shaped you today? Yeah, I mean, I really, um, I lean into all the transgressions I've had in life. Like, I don't look at anything being shot or losing my brother or being in foster care or being molested or my coming out story. Like, I look at it all as it's just the journey that the life I live is kind of afforded to me. Because I learned early on how to go through so much, I also learned how to survive it, how to come on the other side of it. Um, there was a time, I think, where I was not really happy with life, that I allowed whatever I felt to just come out. So my whole thing was I embraced the words, fuck it, like, fuck it. Like, fuck it was a good thing. Oh, we got it, oh, cool, fuck it. Or you got a problem, fuck it. You know, I mean, that literally was my mentality coming from Northern California. So for a long time, the way I allowed it to impact me was however I felt, I made sure people felt that. Mm. Good, bad, uh, happy, sad, like, it was just something that I projected. I learned over time how to cope with different things I've gone through, how to take those perceived weaknesses and turn them into my strengths. Uh, using my story, the book, God Must Have Forgot yeah. About Me, to like share it as an offering to other people who are trying to find their way through life. And um, now I understand my power and I've connected that to my purpose. So I'm evolving and I'm allowing myself the experience of making mistakes as I evolve and not wanting to be perfect all the time. You know, people are giving me grace now and I'm in therapy. Like that's a mm. whole other new thing that I never, people always told me you need to go to therapy, but I thought that was people being funny. Like, yo ass need to go get help. Like, <laughs> nigga, you need to get help. Man. Your wife is cheating on you. Your kids is on drugs. Like, yo shit, your dog is even up. Like, your whole <laughs> life is a mess, but I need therapy. You know, I felt like people were always projecting the need to get therapy on me. Until I really just like started the process of self-love and the journey of like really looking at myself in the mirror and now I'm in therapy. It, it's a lot to break down with that, but the <laughs> one thing that, that got me was you said, I know my purpose. Yeah. I don't hear a lot of people say that. You have to ask somebody that. Yeah. You know your purpose. You yeah. know what your purpose is. What, yeah. what is that? Well, right now we just defined the three pillars. So at first when we started Hollywood Unlocked, you know, the idea was... You know, I want to go in and show people their favorite celebrities in a way that they can't see because I feel like the way people are writing about them is just not fair. You know, a friend of mine who's been on the show, Floyd Mayweather, we would go places and, you know, when you know Floyd uh, intimately, you know, he's never going to be on time. He's always going to have a shopping trip in the run of a day. There's going to be three to five or 12 girlfriends. 
don't know most of them some of the time, and we're going to hit a strip club. That's what we know is going to happen with Floyd. Um, but when you get to know him personally, you know, he's a very generous person, very caring, very thoughtful, very confident in himself. He makes sure that other people around him feel the same energy, and he's always pushing you through stories of what he's gone through to be greater. And I felt like when I saw him in the duality in a private way, I didn't see that publicly. It was always like, you know, the drama around him. And so I wanted to create a space to show people their favorite celebrity. But when I got in the game, people wouldn't let me in because they were afraid. Like, oh, he's gonna be messy, he's gonna be... This is before I was even messy. So I said, okay, you know what? <laughs> All right, you asked for it. And I literally locked into my, at the time, what I thought was my purpose. And my purpose was to just be very disruptive. I'm gonna disrupt the space. And so once I did that and I started seeing the reaction and the pickup and the viral moments and the numbers and the money, it was like, okay, you know what? Let me just pour some gas on this then. Mm -hmm. And then that's where I became more strategic with the purpose of going viral, with the purpose of being disruptive, not with the purpose of connecting to what I believe my calling was. So it wasn't until I really just kind of grew through all that and just felt like, okay, I'm working on myself all the low vibrational energy that I know how to create very well, even still to this day, uh, I'm gonna be a little bit more temperate and a little bit more strategic at how I do it and focus on my delivery so that way the message of what I'm trying to do doesn't get lost. And so it's been, a, yeah, I'm a work in progress. Was Love & Hip Hop a part of the, the process and the, and the strategy of getting to where you are now? See, it's interesting. What I've learned along the way is that I've always been smart. I've always been intelligent. Been, being smart and intelligent, two different things. I've been street smart because I've survived the streets of Stockton, one of the most dangerous cities in the country. Um, I survived foster care. I survived not losing myself to drugs or suicide or a prison. Having gone through what I've gone through, you know, when you watch your brother get his brains blown out and you watch the police step in the brains and have a conversation about mm. it, it, in a way it dehumanizes a person that you love the most. You can literally lose your mind if you allow yourself to. So when I look at how all the things I survived and I looked at my behavior, my behavior, it would have made sense to be on a love and hip hop, but love and hip hop wasn't the door I wanted to go in. It just was the only door that opened for me. And that was, you know, it's very telling because just this morning I had a call with a Fortune 500 brand about this big multi-year, multi-million dollar partnership. And I'm talking to them. And when I was thinking about how I would tell my story, because I knew that they had done their research and it was gonna start at Love & Hip Hop because that's when they got to know me. I started with the foster kid, the kid that made it out the hood, the kid that had a dream, the kid that couldn't find an opportunity. And the only door that opened in the mainstream ecosystem of media was Love & Hip Hop. So I had to shape who I believed I was around a show that wasn't necessarily who I was. That's not who the industry knew me. That's not who my friends knew me. That's not who my family knew me. So once I got in that door and I met with them, it was very clear they wanted somebody who was gonna stir up all the shit, mm -hmm. somebody who was gonna be in everybody's business. And I said, well, Hollywood Unlocked is my business. Everybody's business is my business. And then I got in and I played my position and I did it well. Well, then I started doing things and falling into situations in the show that I couldn't control. And that was actually what was the beauty in my brand because it built my podcast. That's what made me go and start my podcast. And as you know, having a successful show like this, I mean, you you have a platform that you fully control how your audience sees you and what you say. And that, that became the tipping point in like changing the public's um, perception slowly, very slowly, from seeing me on this one TV show to saying, well, that ain't who I see over here. And while I don't regret it because it was a door that fast-tracked Hollywood Unlocked in front of the world. It's something that I look back now and I say, okay, just like with my sexuality, I don't want to lead with that, but it's definitely a part of uh, the fabric of who I've become. We see those shows and a lot of times they come at you very dramatic. Yeah. Right? It's this, it's that, it's loud, it's all of that. How often would you guys go off script? It wasn't scripted for me. Were there people on the show that we know like, okay, you just hopped off a jet. You ain't got no damn jet. You living in a hotel. <laughs> we know this. But you know, I always said to them, don't put me in a scene where they're doing all of that because I'm literally going to call them out. I just can't be around fake. Fake is just not something that I can do. I can't talk to you about your yacht if I know that you don't even have a bathtub at your house. Like, we're not gonna do that. So they knew putting me in those situations, we're gonna create those things, you know? Um, mine was never scripted. I think the one thing I, I had a problem with when I left and went to Wild and Out and having an experience with MTV that was very different than VH1 was, you're letting your audience believe I'm an emotionless tree who's just messy and wants to show up and throw drinks at women. That's mm -hmm. what you're doing. And as a gay man, um, a black gay man in the world of entertainment, who's 
best friend is one of the most successful athletes in the world, and whose other best friend is a very successful female artist in the world. Like, how is it that I've allowed myself to be used as a prop? Mm. How? How am I this intelligent? How did I survive all the stuff I just told you and then end up on national television in front of the whole world as the expectation of what they think a gay black man should look like? So I had to really reconcile with myself that I had to pivot yeah. uh, <laughs> from this thing that they wanted me to be to who I knew me to be. And so, yeah, it was, um, I don't think they were scripted storylines. I think the talent comes up with their ideas of what they want the public to think of them, but that's why most of them now aren't successful because your storyline ran its course, the network yeah. shut it down, you had no ownership in nothing, and you you don't got no love or hip hop. Now you're just out there famous <laughs> <laughs> and, and so broke. We're, we're here with uh, Jason Lee, CEO of Hollywood Unlocked, and listening to you speak about your friends and the people you form relationships with, but also the perception that you allow the world to see by being on Love & Hip Hop and the kind of narratives that they can create. What type of work do you have to do in your relationships to get people to trust you? Because you say they painted you as the, the messy gay guy who is gonna throw drinks in people's face, but when you are friends with the Floyd Mayweathers and the other extremely successful and famous people, how do you get them to trust you, embrace you um, in the way that you guys have in order to build these bonds? I connect with people. It's sort of like when I saw you at Super Bowl, the first thing I said was congratulations on all your success because I've been watching you all at least should build this thing. I know how it is, even though each of you have individual successes in your careers, but to come together, find chemistry, have moments that create a conversation in this space when we know that conversations like these often get diluted yeah. because it's an oversaturated market. Everybody wants a talk show, right? Or a podcast. They don't deserve it, but they have one. But <laughs> I ain't talking about nobody y'all know. I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't want to bring no mess well, to the Here goes. we go. I ain't gonna lie. I said I was gonna come in here and be a little different. But the, the thing is this. Anybody can podcast, yeah. not everybody can pivot. That part. And you know what? Pivoting, code switching, being able to, you know, have the humility to see when things aren't necessarily working yeah. and make adjustments so it works. You know, that's what the audience connects with. And I feel like, you know, whether it's a Floyd or a Cardi or a Tiffany Addish or a Rihanna or even the vice president of the United States or you, when I talk to people, I just like to connect with good energy. If I feel you have bad energy, you're going to get a different experience with me. Yeah. If you are not real to me or you don't reveal yourself to me, when I feel like I'm being very vulnerable and transparent with you, then I just feel like it's a surface relationship, so I'm yeah. not gonna go deeper. I don't change in how I behave with Rihanna or Cardi or Floyd or you or Alicia. Like, what you see is what you get. And oftentimes, I feel like when I walk in a room, and I'll, I'll share a quick story. I was having a conversation with somebody who was very powerful in media, and they called, they texted me the other day when I was doing an interview, and they said, when do you want to come on our platform and reconcile your relationship with black women? And I had to really sit with that text for a minute because I've learned how to not be reactionary right away, and I have a lot of respect for this black woman who sent me this. So I sat with it, and I texted her back. I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, black women believe that you have a problem with them. So I started thinking like, it's not the vice president who I just had coffee with, it's not Cardi B, it's not uh, Rihanna, it's not Queen Latifah, it's, it's not my staff, it's okay. Well, my reaction to her was, I am an equal opportunity agitator. I have stood behind Dave Chappelle when he did a stand-up special and disagreed with the trans community. I've stood against um, mainstream ecosystem of media projecting black gay men just wearing high heels and makeup and purses and being sidekicks to reality star women. I've said very clearly I don't date white men because I can't date somebody that doesn't understand my journey and hasn't been a part of my struggle. But it doesn't mean that all those groups don't have value and don't have uh, a purpose in life or anything. It's just, I'm saying my opinion. If I saw a woman that I thought was ugly, it's not because she's from Africa, it's just she ugly. Um, she ugly, her kid's gonna be ugly, her friend's probably ugly, everybody uh. ugly. But that's my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> ugly energy? Just ugly energy. <laughs> now, that's the thing. You can have positive energy and be beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know? I just probably not gonna lay next to you, but <laughs> but I like when you walk in the room. You know what I mean? So like I say, I think Lizzo's beautiful. You know, I, I think she radiates uh, confidence and beauty in, in her own way. And, and I just feel like uh, people have always wanted to control my free thought. And 
I, I said to her, I want to welcome a conversation about my relationship with black women in a very public way. She said, I want you to feel safe. I said, the only way I'll feel safe is if it's really honest, like how you all banned me mm. from having access to your female audience because of your perception of me. So you canceled culture. Cancel culture is the cancer that's killing art. I'm a part of the culture as a culture disruptor, culture shifter, but you don't get to tell me my contribution to culture. Just like I can't tell Dave Chappelle, don't tell me your story about that relationship with trans or don't say a joke about trans because it hurts my feelings. Guess what? The best people to do this business are people who provoke emotion. And art should create energy that makes us all talk. And so whether a friend's telling me how great Trump is, may not always agree. <laughs> or a person telling me, you know, Barack Obama, you know, didn't do enough for black people. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. That's your thought. I welcome the conversation. Let's talk about it. But I feel like um, many times people expect me to just go along to get along. And that shit just is not the fabric of who I am. So, yeah, Rihanna, she filled me up by seeing me as a human being. Floyd told me I was going to be the greatest before I believed I was going to be the greatest. Queen Latifah stayed on the phone with me tonight. My brother got murdered and talked me through it 26 years ago. So everybody has had a different experience with me. If you, but I always say like, if you judge me or judge a group of people, if you judge Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union for how they stand behind their daughter, or if you judge uh, the mother, Breonna Taylor, who feels like there should be more laws to protect black women and men from being killed by police officers. If you feel, you know, that I as a black man shouldn't interview Trump, I should only interview Obama, that's your choice. But I get to choose to think differently and you have to either respect it or not have the luxury of having an experience with me that's valuable. And being that uh, honest and open and just, it's really, it's everybody's opinion. It's your opinion, what you feel about yeah. certain sex and you know different situations yeah. that happen. Is there a group of people or somebody that you think about before you answer, before you make strong opinions? No. Because my thing is my wife. Yeah. Like anything, I, I say anything, like you're saying, color, race, sex, any of that stuff, I don't give a damn, I argue with you. Yeah. I really do think about not upsetting my wife before I say, and I know you know when crazy shit's about to be said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's nobody but out there. But didn't you go on a talk show and catch some shit from what you said? Yes. It was Tamara, right? Yeah, the Tamara. And, and look at Tamara out there acting out right now. She being messy with Angela Yee and the Breakfast Club trying to throw Charlemagne under the under the boat. Who else she under? Larsa Pippen? Larsa you know Pippen. She brought up the George. What the hell the George shoe? But here's the deal. We all got Gee, shit. look at the time, man. <laughs> but the thing is, we all be good, bro. Y'all keep it cool. I'm going to get out of here. Y'all be good. No, but I'm, just saying, like, I'm just saying, like, we all got shit. Yeah. Yeah. But you got to be careful, because see, when you start telling people how to think and what not to say and what not, then your shit got thrown out there. I don't like the fake shit. I feel like those are the people who are going to end up with the in the boneyard with the other dinosaurs because real is rare and people are looking for what cuts through the bullshit. And when, when you were on the show, you just were telling your truth. And look at the Instagram. Here you all on social media. When I see you and I see your contribution to culture and what you're doing and building, and it's very easy for people to sit back and judge, but are they willing to get in the ring and fight like we do every day and do this thing? No. Is there any part of the backlash or being canceled and all of those things, are there any parts of that that ever affect you, that ever make you think to yourself, maybe I should change the way I go about doing my job or I go about living? No, because when you own yourself, when you own your platform, when you own your business, there's a certain level of freedom that comes from that. There's no brand, no check that can say, if you go down this lane, you're, you're, you're gonna lose me. Okay, well, there's a competitor out there that's looking for me to lose you. So I, I look at it as I'm in a position of strength. So this is no longer going to work for Fashion Nova. Well, there's Pretty Little Thing. Okay, Pretty Little Thing is not gonna work for you. Well, there's the Sheen. Uh, I'll fly to Japan and sit down with the people at Sheen to get that deal just so I can come back and build this big plan. And I feel like with cancel culture, brands, media try to control how you behave, how you move, how you think. If you don't fall in line with this, this doesn't align with our values. Well, wasn't your CEO just caught cheating with an underage kid or were they didn't your pastor just do something with an altar boy? Like, how, how far back do we need to peel back cancel culture? Because if you really peel it all the way back, you would say Joe Rogan saying a million times, uh, and Whoopi Goldberg getting suspended, there's a disparity there. And we all know that cancel culture is really designed to cancel culture. So yeah, I'm not afraid of none of that. And I really feel like in, in what I said to the brand I talked to today was, 
if you want the millions of people that I speak to, I mean, 275 million impressions a week, over a billion minutes watched, uh, you know, millions and millions of people, and then our ecosystem of people to distribute our content. If you want that, there's the price to pay for it, but here's also the understanding that you're not sponsoring, you're investing. You're giving me your money to invest in getting access to my audience, and I'm telling my audience that they can trust you. So it's a symbiotic relationship. But if you want to cancel me, great, then I'm gonna go tell everybody why I'm canceled. You were very vocal about the white PR of black stars and of whether it's black entertainers or, or sports figures, pushing them toward what they were familiar and comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And then you had an opportunity to interview. I forget who the actress was, but she made she made sure to give you some time and you thanked her yeah. and said, look, I, I appreciate you taking the time because we understand why every how everybody pushes you away from the black media. Why was it so important for you to make sure the world understood the type of adversities you were fighting or people like us or people like you were fighting in order to get into that genre? It's a great question. And it's also pivoting. Let me tell you how it started. Um, you're talking about Halle Berry. She gave a moment to a journalist named Emerald Marie on a carpet where she was being pulled by her white publicists away from black media. And then she said, no, I need to go talk to him. And she came back in. That happened right after I had gone on The Breakfast Club and said, fuck the NAACP, fuck Sunshine and Sacks, fuck Slate PR, um, because they had denied access to my team to cover the Image Awards, but they wanted us to come to the brunch to promote for their sponsors who they were honoring. And I said, that's like, that's like a different level of gatekeeping. Now what you're saying is you're going to invite all the media to come and give you all the millions of impressions to support your sponsors by keeping us in the back. But then you're going to put all of the mainstream media at the top of the carpet to cover Beyonce and Angela Bass and all the people that we talk about every day. So I went on The Breakfast Club and I mean, I let them have it. Um, and I heard everybody. I mean, I and I literally said, <laughs> F the NAACP F and those people. And I mean, the Internet went crazy and I went to lunch. I didn't lose a night's sleep. <laughs> I didn't lose any of that because that's how I feel and that's how I felt. What, the reason why I said that was, I said, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and take the hit for everybody. All the black journalists who get up every day and fight hard to go to a place to, to talk to people that we love and celebrate every day, to promote them to millions of people, for them to sell to their sponsors, only to be pulled at the end of a carpet, to be given maybe a half of a question while E! Online or Entertainment Tonight and all these other people, Hollywood reporters that don't look like us, who seem or perceived to be more valuable, get the most time. And it's the white publicists for these black organizations like NAACP that control that. So if you piss them off, they shut you down from being able to have access to culture. So these black organizations, historically like a BET, now NAACP, will hire these companies to gatekeep culture. So I, I took that on. And then I started educating people like, Kevin Hart and Tiffany Haddish about like, when you go to the carpet, just take a look. And then now they go and they walk straight to us mm -hmm. and then they go back or they'll come and they'll say, hey, I gotta go here, I gotta go there. And I haven't shared this yet, but I will say, I just got some clippings because we started doing something else too. We started taking two cameras, filming people on the carpet and filming us filming people on the carpet. So that way we can see the whole experience. At the Creed premiere, my team saw Chloe Bailey she always shows us love. She came over, she came over with a black publicist and the black publicist brought her up to us and she answered all the questions we asked her. And then I saw a clip of Michael B. Jordan brought over by a white publicist. He answered one real surface level question and then she pulled him away. And I haven't put that out yet because I'm thinking of the way I wanna put it out because I do love Michael B. Jordan, what he represents and how important he is to the culture and all that. But it's almost like, it's still happening. That, that segregation of how they separate us on the carpet and the disparity of how they allow us to have access to our people is still happening. That's why I've never done a red carpet because I will be the one on the carpet to see, nah, nah, come over here. You bring your, I, you will literally be a moment. They won't let me on the carpet for those purposes because I wouldn't be able to come <laughs> Well, Jason, you're trying to break down this invisible wall, if you want to put it in front of the red carpet or the, the prejudice, the racism that the media yes. has. Do you think you're going about it the right way? Because they hate your ass now, I would guess. They don't, they don't enjoy this. They're, no. Are you breaking them down or are you making them no. dislike you more? Well, let me tell you what happened. Again, I believe that we are conditioned to believe that we have to be submissive 
to the mm. bullshit and in fear of losing something. My business had a 77% compound annual growth rate. For people that don't know what that means, our revenue tripled the year before, doubled last year, and now after getting a $50 million valuation, we want to double the amount of money we make this year. Uh, I got denied access to that award show. I went and launched my own award show, the Hollywood Unlock Impact Awards. We just had Mariah Carey and Floyd and Tiffany and Lizzo, and this year we're coming back even bigger and better. So I don't believe that because you don't allow me to come back, my life is over. I just go create it, you know? I go create my own. And going back to your original question, you know, that strength comes back from when I lost my brother, I didn't lose my life. In fact, I gained more purpose. And so I mm -hmm. now live in that, and I allow that to motivate me. Now, does it make it uncomfortable? Yeah, it makes it uncomfortable for them because just yesterday I went to an event. When I walked in, I can feel the energy. You know, I can feel it. You know, and I, but I, but I, I went and I tapped Jordan Woods on the shoulder. Hi, how are you? I'm the one that wrote the story about her and Tristan Thompson. I mean, I, everybody that I knew was going to be uncomfortable, I went and said hello to them because I'm, I, I'm not mad. Um, do I think I'm going about it in the wrong way? I think I'm a culture disruptor. I think in the end, people will respect my my fearlessness. Um, They'll say whatever they want about me, but I don't let their opinions rent space in my head. And regardless of, you know, what people say, it has to mean something for you to be able to go out there and raise $1.7 million and receive that $50 million valuation. I mean, you're trusted. It says a lot, right? Yeah, but I also think people are smart about who's moving the needle and they see the growth of the company and they see the trajectory. I mean, we did this in the last seven years. You know, we, I have probably 10 more good years left in me, but we're, we have some very big projects that we're building. Um, yeah, I think there's a certain level of trust. I mean, fiscally, I'm responsible. I'm not wasting money. Everything I make, I pour right back into the business. Um, there's deals that I don't take because although I want the millions of dollars, I just know like ownership is important and being able to stay in control and be able to be authentically real and transparent. You know, do I want to be liked more? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, <laughs> it feels good yeah. to, to be liked, but at what cost? You know, um, if I sit down with the vice president, I have to tell her that my optics matter too. You know, me sitting here with you and how it looks for me to sit here with you matter. And so what you do and how you pour into me. Vice President heard me talking shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They can do anything from the White House now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Timing was questionable, Kamala. <laughs> but, you know, sitting down with her, optics matter. And even, you know, when, when somebody said, oh, you know, reconcile with black women. Well, that's a black woman that I reached out to to sit down and say, how can I help you, you know? Uh, so again, I, I can't like really like, get caught up on what people think. But in terms of people trusting me with the investment, I mean, yeah, I, mean, we, I, I came in saying that I knew my exit was gonna be this and that I wanna build a billion dollar brand and I wanna figure out how to turn, transition to a network and create more shows. And I think with, with building the Jason Lee show and Hollywood Unlocked and Censor and the different things I built, it's really shown me like, I know how to build a show. I know how to monetize a show. I know how to execute and get a show picked up. So why don't I just become my own network? Let's say I worked for Hollywood Unlocked or something very similar and I were breaking these stories, which are just truth. They're just spreading the facts about what people are doing. They wouldn't call me messy. I might be something else. I might be a disruptor or an agitator, but they wouldn't call me messy. How You talk about being black and what that is in the business. How much do you think being gay plays into that too, where they see you as more, that they, they try to paint you as more catty, messy, petty when you're doing a job you set out to do? I mean, that's true too. I mean, but I look at a lot of the people that, you know, I don't know if Harvey at TMZ is gay, but he's gay, I think. He, well, he seemed gay. I think you gay. You may be gay, I don't know. He gay, but he not black. <laughs> How many stories has Harvey broke that have ruined lives, that have lied about people being dead? I said the queen was dead, the whole world fell apart. Okay, maybe she wasn't dead. I Googled the other day, we didn't see her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm let y'all If you don't see nobody, they dead. What? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but anyway, whatever. I'm gonna leave that alone. You know. Uh, you know. The queen died. Everybody just fell apart. Um, you know. But TMZ killed Lil Wayne hella times. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Like he's important to us. Like the queen is important to y'all. But y'all didn't cancel Harvey. <laughs> you know. In fact, the same black people who who say Wayne is their god will still be the same black people to call TMZ to say, "Come shoot me coming out of the Ivy." You know. We have this weird 
thing that we have to figure out with ourselves of how do we protect our people? How do we control our narratives? How do we participate in narratives that aren't true? But then I also get challenged with, but aren't you a part of it? Because you have the platform that drives these conversations. Yeah. So I always say, look, who's to blame? The people doing the mess, the people like me that are profiting from it, or the people like you that can't consume enough of it. We're all a part of the mess. So let's just stop calling each other messy and just live. But yeah, I think when it comes to mainstream media, Us Magazine, because it's pretty and pink, and uh, it, they're, they're doing the same thing I'm doing. Uh, but that's where I went back to my original values that I established in life was saying, fuck it, fuck it. That's what you think I'm messy, cool. That's what your thought. Um, I just have not really participated in that because I, can, I learned a long time ago, I cannot control what people think. You know, uh, the same people that say I'm messy, or say that Beyonce was running from me at a brunch are the same people that can never get in a room with Beyonce. Mm. Like you can't even afford a ticket to her concert. The only beehive you know is probably one in your grandma backyard. But guess what? <laughs> I'm in the rooms, yeah. but I'm in the rooms for them. You know, and that's the part that I can't reconcile with is that I really am the person that's in the room as a fan of the culture, a fan of pop culture, a fan of celebrity culture for them. I went to the same party you all were at. You know, y'all got in a fight on the red carpet. Oh, hey, 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 we not hey, talking about it. a loud disagreement. You know. <laughs> Y'all hey, some big dudes, too. I don't want no smoke. I, You know, people need to choose the right place, right people, right time. That wasn't it. But, you know, I went to that party, and in that party, I had to walk up to a little baby to say, hey, I know that you know I've been trying to interview you. I want to tell you to your face how much I respect you. I want to tell you to your face I love what you're doing with your platform. I'm also the same person that revealed he had a relationship with Saweetie. And I also interviewed his baby mom, so I know he probably has his own thoughts, but we were able to have a conversation. He was like, yo, I really f with you. Like, I wanna come on the show. Then I walked over and saw Drake, who I've known from before he was even a rapper, who I have a great relationship with, who just told me how proud he was of me. And I said, hey man, can't wait to get you on the new show. And he turned to me and said, man, I ain't fucking with that. In public, I was like, this is not the Drake that I know. But I, but I was aware there were so many people dick writing him at the party that he probably forgot that I really know him as a real human being. And I'm not a dick writer. So I said, well, okay, well, all right, Drake, well, or, or Aubrey, have a great day. You know, that was some weird shit. Um, I haven't talked to him yet. I do want to talk to him. I'm sure you'll see it. It was crazy, but I want to be popular. I am popular. I'm just not always liked, and that's okay. Maneuvering through the, let's call it the messy media maze. Yes. Uh, I'm sure it, it wasn't easy, but people look at you and they see, you know, the glitz and glamour and what you're doing over at Hollywood Unlocked. Most people think it can be easy, but I'm sure it's challenging. The no's you received throughout your journey. Mm. Do you try and shit on those people? Yes. Yes. I'm so glad he didn't lie. I thought he was about to lie. <laughs> Y'all do it too, don't you? Look, let me stop here, man. Let me stop. You know, I shit on them with success. When I went out first to talk to people about investing in my vision, and they rejected me, I see them out now, and when they say, oh my God, I always knew you were, I, I stop them and I say, no, you didn't. You absolutely did not believe in it. In fact, you told me to abandon my dream. You told me to go be something else. You told me there was no room in the space for me. So I hold them accountable in a very personal, very like transparent way, like, no, you didn't believe in me, and it's okay, you know? Now that I have the Jason Lee Show, and we're over at Revolt, and we're you know getting millions and millions of views and impressions, whatever, now people say, hey, do you want to interview my client? No, just that's not a conversation that I'm motivated to have right now, you know? Because unless I can start the conversation with, it's great that you finally showed up, and we can have that conversation, then this is probably not the show for them. But no, I don't need to prove anything to anybody because what I'm challenged with every day when I wake up is how do I continue to prove to myself that I could be better? You know, how right now the level of restraint that I'm showing and not going online and saying things about people that I want to because it will make me feel better for people to know what I know. But then at the same time, it may scare the people that don't know all the background that they may think that I'm still that person that they once thought I was. So. I'm just fighting with myself and proving to myself, not necessarily other people, but I do rub it in their faces with success and access, like releasing Rihanna's baby photos. Mm -hmm. I released the baby photos, then I flew from Dubai and went to the vice president's house, and all of black media was there for a Christmas party, and everybody's whole thing was, how did you get it? How did you get it? How did you get it? I said, she called me and she gave them to me. I said, the question you should be asking you is why she didn't give them to you? <laughs> Because the same person that you know or think you know is the same person she know. And I think the reason is because she trusted me and at the top of her mind when she knew somebody was gonna release her baby photos without her permission, she thought of me. And that's because I work hard to be real to people. Whether you know they choose to participate or not, that's on them. 
Isn't it a conflict of interest, your friend list and what you do? Be- because of the fact that, like, Larissa Pippen. Yeah. She call you and say, hey, I'm going to date this little baby. You already know, even if you agree or disagree, you're going to take your friend's side. I would assume this. Like, do you treat your friends the same way? Because there's your, your friend list. I got some some messy situations. <laughs> I come at you and be like, bro, if you're a real friend of this lady, you'll yeah. tell her, stop chasing around these damn babies. Yeah. Okay. I have a response to that. Uh, one, do my friends drive high, do what I do? No. So, like, I'll give you an example. When Floyd and 50 got into that whole he can't read thing, I know Floyd. I've been on the set with him when he's read for Showtime or done scripting or whatever. You know, do I think that Floyd is running around with a bag full of Maya Angelou books? No, but neither am I. Can he read? Yes. And if you can't read and can make a billion dollars, motherfucker, I want to give up reading today. (laughs) Okay? Because the reading rainbow ain't never did nothing for nobody that his career has done for him. But I still had to write about what 50 said. Mm -hmm. And I I called Floyd. I put this out there. He he knows. But then he'll go do his shit, and then I'll put out what he says. You know? I'll go have dinner with 50 and say, man, I don't know why y'all not getting along. And then turn right around and praise him for his show on Stars, and then go right over and post whatever he's going through with, you know, the people he's going through. No, this is the thing I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with right now, and I'm gra- glad you asked that question. I don't want no more celebrity friends. Like, if you're a celebrity, I do not want to be your friend because the people who happen to be celebrities that are my friends understand my job. It's sort of like if Cardi, when Cardi B put out a song that I didn't like, I had to tell her, I don't like that song. She had to be able to eat that, just like I have to be able to eat when I write a story, and she called and said, I don't like that story you wrote. Well, you did your best to make that song, and I did my best to make sure my team wrote that story. Maybe we felt a little short, that's okay. But my job is easier to be villainized because I'm black and I'm gay and I'm in media. That's just what it is. But no, let's go to Larson. I know many men uh, who've dated a lot younger women. I think that the reason why 72% of my audience are female is because they understand the double standard. They understand that they live in a world where a bunch of white men are taking votes on whether or not they can have babies or not. Uh, we live in a world where women are often told that they that if they have 10 sexual partners, they lose value, and a man having 10 sexual partners gives them value. Uh, so I tend to be a little bit more objective in reporting that, not because it's Larsa. I told Larsa when she started dating the guy, you sure? Not because of his age, but because of who he was, mm-hmm. because of his father and her relationship with Scotty. Right. So we had that conversation, but she also called me to say, I'm taking a beating online, huh? I said, yeah, you are. And we gonna keep posting it. <laughs> <laughs> and she never says anything. You know, she yeah. understands my job. I've also interviewed her about her divorce with Scotty Pippen in Scotty's house. When Scotty walked in the door, as I'm asking the question, door opens, Scotty's, I'm like, hold on, we gonna take a break. <laughs> Big, you know, (laughs) Um, but you know, I think that there's a lot of ways to look at that. Can I look at that and say your son's in the NBA and he's on a team with Malik Beasley, who you were with, and now you're dating Michael Jordan's son, who was the son of the person that your ex-husband, their father was on a team with. This some real housewives of Miami shit, (laughs) but she's on the show. I said, lean into it. Because if you're going to do it and take the hit for it, lean. I did a call with her and him after Tamron Hall's messy ass interview and said, lean into it. Because if you're going to take the beating, y'all need to launch a relationship book. I would launch a relationship podcast. I would be dressed alike front row at a game. I would be letting him carry you through the subway. I would be fucking going viral. Lean into it. Give him something to talk about. Because they didn't say nothing about Melania laying up there with Trump, and she's 30 years younger. Different rules apply to different people, whether it's racial groups, whether it's gays, whether it's women. And I say, look, if you are however old she is, all your kids are growing up, you know, and all great kids, you're a great mom, um, and you want to get out there and do your thing. And if a younger does it for you, do your thing. And if an older does it for you, do your thing. Do your thing. Shit. Because I can't be selectively messy. If I'm going to be talking about that, I got to talk about some of these basketball players out here running around with these white girls at the strip clubs but married to their black queens. Come on now. Y'all don't want it. Don't get me started. Here. <laughs> that's why you're drinking none of this or whatever. Because that's why people get scared. Because once they start to say, well, do you think that that's fair? Then I start to go in a different direction that they didn't know. And it starts to pull everybody else in. The reality is that we all have mess. I have mess. 
and the mess is okay. We shouldn't run from it. My question is this, though. I'm in the sports media. As a black man in the sports media, there is a level of responsibility, I believe I put on myself for the culture and to speak for people that look like me that are going through certain things. And there's a responsibility that the culture puts on you too. We can speak about the things that Tamron's done or speak about these different things and because you're reporting facts. What do you feel your responsibility is to build mm -hmm. as well, to build up black women, to build up yeah. black culture, to not just talk about the stories that get the clicks, but the stories that people can look at and say, okay, this black man who happens to be gay, who happens to own Hollywood Unlocked, also is doing this to make sure the culture is preserved more so than tearing it down. I am now at a level of my career where I see the impact of my yeah. platform to where I'm, I'm not as reactionary as I used to be, you know, because I know that the perceptions out there, when I hear the perceptions, I'm, I'm a little bit more mindful of what I'm saying, but I don't let it completely uh, direct how I do what I do because then I'm not staying true to my voice. I'm not staying true to what I believe. I got that from the work I did in the labor movement when I was representing healthcare workers, fighting for better patient standards and better pay, that they had their idea of what they needed in order to be better. And I had the task of going out and speaking for them, even in the midst of their organizations or the public saying that they already had enough. You know, if you think about it now, there are people in Florida that say black people have enough equality. We don't need to read about their history in the book classrooms or we don't need to have all these voter right conversations because they can vote. They don't vote. You know, I don't I don't really think about people's personal views when I say what I say or when we do what we do. I think about what I stand on and what I stand on is trying to be as true to fact as possible, trying to be as fair as possible trying to get both sides of the uh, conversation. So we do reach out to people to say, hey, by the way, this is getting ready to go out or this just came over to us, give me some context. And there's times that I've killed stories my staff want to do because yeah. I talk to the person or I'll see some, I'll say, well, why did you guys post this? When you know I know the person, let me call them and I'll get on the phone and call a person um, to, to verify it. And I've deleted stories that I felt like my team was not fair, like that's not fair or, or I'll see it and say like, we shouldn't go down that way. But I'm not in the business of like completely selling out to anybody because of the pressure. And they pressure me, you know, people say whatever they said or call me or whatever, or they're threatening to take a deal or something. But you know, now I think people are starting to really understand like, we're not your enemy. We're literally saying what's out there and then having an opinion on it, but also welcoming you into the conversation. And the other thing is the culture needs to do some reconciliation with itself because we're the same people that can't wait to eat on our own. But then we turn around and say, oh, white folks ain't giving us nothing. Go build your own shit. Go build your own shit. Go collaborate with other black people. Like I'm black, y'all black. I'm here collaborate with you. You come on my show. It's about community. It's not about the haves and have nots. It's about the who want to go get it more and who don't. I hear that part of the conversation. And I think you are showing that through your actions, right? By sitting here, by having whether well, it's black women, you know, Larsa Pippen, who's somebody's your friend on your show, you are trying to reach out and allow people to tell their story, which is what we want to do here as well. But when you've gotten the negativity throughout your career, does new information, does evolution ever come into play where it's not you selling out, right? It's not Jason saying, okay, I'm getting this pressure, so now I'm going to be different. Like sometimes you just learn a new way to go about business. Mm -mm. Are you getting closer to that point? You know, you made the joke when we took a little break. Nah, I just started therapy. It ain't quite sunk in all the way and that's why you're getting what you're getting. As you move forward, do you see things about the way you live, about the way you work being different as you start to learn more about yourself? When we did the Queen story and the Queen died, well, when she died on Hollywood Unlocked, I was in Miami driving down Biscayne and the internet was going crazy. Social media phones were blowing up or whatever. And I was just like, what is, going, what is wrong with the people? And then they were attacking me from every country. And I just said, well, okay, well, since people are mad, let me just go ahead and double down. Like, what y'all talking about? I ain't never got it wrong, she dead. When I double down, they, it really went crazy, right? They really, they want, these people want me dead. Called the Buckingham Palace and said, where's the queen at? She dead, and they said, we can't confirm or deny. That's the dead to me, because you, you call my house and say, is Jason dead? No, he upstairs in the jacuzzi. <laughs> <laughs> when, when somebody call your house and say, can I speak to so-and-so, and they said, I can't confirm or deny if they're, what the fuck? That's just nonsense. 
So once they said we can't confirm or deny, she did. So I doubled down. They went crazy. Well, guess what? This reporter sent me an email. She caught me at the right time. I was getting on a yacht. Everybody thought I was somewhere in a dark room trying to kill myself. I was getting on a yacht, had my drink in my hand. This reporter caught me with a really nice email. She tricked me. I thought she was cool. So I called her like, hey, BuzzFeed, you know, telling her what's up. She's messy as hell. Went and made this crazy story. So I tripled down, you know, three strikes and you out. What happened was, what I learned in that experience was, to check your ego at the door. And it's okay to make mistakes if you fix them, but you know how you go about it and handle it is, is important. But I never felt like I need to pander to anybody's thought of who I am because I'm in control of my journey. And if everybody that's watched me from the beginning has seen the evolution, I'm still in my process. Right. Uh, but now because I understand my relationships that are visible, I gotta think about, okay, I know who's connected to me now and I know who people know I know, so I gotta be very mindful on how I carry myself and who I share space with. But I've also tightened up my team, I've tightened up who has access to me. I'm not at all afraid of being controversial because honesty today is controversial. Mm -hmm. But when the queen died, why weren't black people mad about the, the blood diamonds that her whole family has stolen and still have over there at the royal palace? That's what I'm saying that all these Africans who died, slaughtered for jewels that come from our, the riches of our country, our motherland. Black Twitter wasn't worried about that. They just, oh, this killed the queen. You don't even watch The Crown on Netflix. You don't even watch The Crown. Like, that's why I say it's the hypocrisy. That's why I don't invest in, when Black Twitter goes off, you know what I do? My team calls me, they go, hey, Black Twitter's dragging you. I go right over there to Black Twitter and be like, fuck y'all. And then black Twitter goes crazy. He ain't black. See, he ain't black. I may even throw it in there because I'm just going to get y'all brought up because I'm still making money. I'm not even thinking about y'all. And I know some would say that's toxic. You're participating in toxicity. Well, sometimes there are days that I do feel like I'm going to get on the ground and roll with the pigs today. Not on Monday because that's the day right after Sunday. That was the Lord's Day. So Monday is still kind of Lordish. I'm going to do my paperwork. But by Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, Right in time for the weekend, I'll roll around with you if you want to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we have this thing we call ourselves almost famous because we're not really famous. Like, you yes, were, you are because I'm in the gym and you on TV, <laughs> you on tap. Like, y'all are everywhere. We're at the Fanatics part. We were working. You yeah. were being a celebrity. You were fighting. You know, and we, and Stop I come playing. in. See how you play with me? See how you're trying me? Stop and playing. So, <laughs> so, I know playing. I'm scared to ask the question. I'm no. telling you, like, no, hey, you. Because I ain't an athlete. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, <laughs> so anyway, I come I in, right? I'm an athlete. So I'm scared. I'm just going to keep talking. So I'm, you know, I'm moving around. And you're seeing all these people, and they're famous. And I say, okay, the one person I wanted to talk to, you behind the velvet rope, was Tiffany Haddish, oh. right? So I was like, he's like, go ahead. Like, okay, come in, go say hello. So I, I walk over. I got my pivot jacket on, feeling really good about myself at the time. And I asked her to be on the show, which I hardly ever do. I don't just walk up to people and ask that. She has zero idea who I am. I'm talking about none. Like, she's really looking, she's like, like, like I had Dookie on my face. But she was sweet and she was nice. So what I'm asking is, since you've now been on our show, just on our show, just say, cause she's your friend, Tiffany, this is a great show. Like, you should do yeah, the show. But Tiffany would do the show. So I don't know why, why I'll, connect, I'll connect y'all. Thank you, that's all I want. Play. In the midst of messy media, people can miss what you really do. And you speak about community, and the fact that you're giving back with the Millionaire Media uh, yeah, yeah, Unlocked. Yeah, Millionaire Media Unlocked. Yeah. And what you're doing for, for people that are uh, uh, aspiring to be bloggers or have podcasts yeah. and teaching them how to be successful there, as well as your involvement with the uh, Hollywood Cares Foundation. Yeah. Speak how much you're involved in community in all your efforts and what yeah. you're doing. Yeah, Media Millionaires Unlocked. The idea was, once I started growing and seeing how influence influential we became and then the, the people that kind of like are at the top of driving culture i'm like yo why are we the only people that do that like why is it th really the three you know we need to open this up because i feel like the culture needs to have more of a voice it needs to be more people that are out there doing it and then when i was on my rise i saw how hard it was to figure it out and i just am somebody that wants to be able to see everybody win so i created it to be able to allow people to find a source to invest in information that took me millions of dollars to figure out. And so Media Millionaires Unlocked is something that um, I created and yeah, it's doing well. And off camera, I asked you about therapy. Yeah. I, I'm in therapy and uh, it's my safe space. What led you to start therapy? Every time I would run into Charlemagne, he would be like, 
why you ain't smiling? You need therapy. I'm like, well, you judging me, you need therapy. You know, we would joke. And then Tiffany, uh, you know, she got into therapy. And then we just, as friends, we would all just be talking about therapy. And then I had written the book, God Must Have Forgotten About Me, and that allowed me to put all my pain in the book. Then I saw the reaction people were having to my stories and then going online and making videos about their own stuff from coming out to dealing with molest or whatever. I decided to lose weight to physically transform because I had done my micronutrient test and realized that I was pre-diabetic and had sleep apnea and had inflammation, different things, and I couldn't lose weight. I, my, my relationship with food was just, I just, when I was hungry, I just ate whatever I could eat. And then I started really looking at myself in the mirror and just trying to have a conversation with myself. But just even taking that type of personal time, my mind was always so full of what was happening in my career and people around me and trips and this and that, that I hadn't slowed down enough to really start to think about like, do you want to live for a while? Do you want to, do you want people to see you and actually see that what you uh, look like, what you say, what you do, what, how you move, how you dress, how you communicate, what community you build, that it all, there's a connection with it all. And so then I start saying, okay, what does that look like? So I did the micronutrient test, found out all the things wrong with me. And then I put a plan together. I said, I'm going to go to the gym for a year. I'm going to eat healthier for a year. I'm going to stop drinking for a year. I'm going to do all these things. And I did all that and I still couldn't lose weight. So I decided that I was going to take matters in my own control, pulled a team of people together, found a really good doctor that one of my friends had used to have weight loss surgery, went and did that. But I went in with the mental mindset that I'm not going to be one of those people that go and do the procedure, gain all the weight back, you know, start going back to living my life the way I want. No, I have to literally change. So I cut out a lot of foods. I changed my consumption of alcohol. I changed my mental uh, support group. And then I thought, okay, now that I physically transformed, now I need to um, explore this mental journey. Because when I met the therapist, I didn't even know he was a therapist. He got in the car with me and Tiffany at a party. He was this cool, happy guy. I'm like, yeah, that's my happy. Uh, he said, where are we going? I said, we're going to hell. And he goes, what? And I go, well, we're going to a gay club, but it's going to feel like hell when you get there. <laughs> so yeah, here I am in hell at the Abbey with Tiffany Haddish, all my gay friends, the strippers and everybody, and this happy man who's sitting there looking at me. But I didn't know he was really probably doing an evaluation of like how toxic I am, you know? <laughs> and I mean, we got so fucked up. I don't even remember how he left. So my first session with him after, you know, Tiffany was like, oh yeah, that's a therapist, you should call him, whatever I called him. I said, okay, so you pretty much have been around me in a very intimate way, a mm -hmm. uh, very vulnerable way. Um, you know, what you think? He said, well, it's not about what I think, it's about what you think. And when I talk to Charlemagne or Tiffany or people who know you personally, they say all these great things about you. And when I see you talk about you online or when people talk about you online, you're very critical of yourself or they're very critical of you. He had read my book and everything. He knew everything. He said, how does somebody who survived a drug addicted mother, abandoned, molested, watch his brother get killed, get shot, survive the streets of Stockton, become very successful, liked by the Rihannas and the Tiffany's and the Floyd's and all these people, see himself the way you do to where you will communicate it to the people who follow you because they like you and let people talk about you in a way that doesn't measure up with how everybody who else sees you. I thought about that and, and I said, well, you know, um, I start coming up with all these excuses and he said, you really need to focus on your healing journey because the person that everybody sees you to be, you don't see you to be. And that was like the beginning of me really like holding people accountable when they try to label me a certain way. Not in a way of being defensive, but saying, hey, while I don't care completely how you see me, let me color in a little bit for you to have more context and then you can walk away and feel how you want. But also not letting those opinions rent space in my head. Talking with him about self-love and value and you know, what do you want your life to look like? Do you want a life partner? Do you want to invest in people? Do you want to stop abandoning relationships the way that relationships abandon you? Because that, going back to fuck it again, I will quick to be like, okay, you ain't on program? Okay, f it. Oh, you not with it? Okay, f it. I, I got a flight to catch. I got shit to do. I got money. I ain't worried about you. Um, <laughs> fuck you. Fuck it. Um, I'm learning that that's not good, you know? Yes. But the process of therapy requires you to really like, it's a level of patience that I'm still learning to get because you have to do the work. So I started journaling, I started writing my thoughts out, then going back and reading what I wrote and you know, trying to make everything line up. So I'm not perfect, but uh, you know, I'm getting there. Is there a, almost like a Spider-Man, Peter Parker thing with you? Yes. Cause your job and what you do, like you come up and when you tell the story and your brothers, yeah. your brothers, you murder, like you're telling the story and it's just a, a fact. Yeah. But it has to, it, it doesn't bring any emotion out of you. When you talk about everything, it's in a certain way. You talk about your friends, you talk about your life, you talk about, Anybody, it's in the same way. Did you have to build a costume to wear over top of yourself no. to do what you do? Because 
we just said it. Like you criticize people, you yeah. judge people all the time. Yeah. But you can't have insecurities if you're if you're throwing the rocks. You can't live in a glass house. Well, I have insecurities, and I, I mean I got insecurities, and I got shit too. But like, you know, I will say I think my brother's death kind of numb me to the point to where like there's nothing that really hurts my feelings because I've, they've already been destroyed. You know what I mean? Like I'm not emotionless. Like I don't I don't feel for people. I have compassion. Most people like me when they know me privately, but it's me letting you get that far with me because I don't handle betrayal well. You know, the most things that people have seen about me that have made people go, oh my God, is when somebody's tried it. Like you tried it, you said something crazy or you did something about me or you betrayed me and then I would personally deal with it publicly. There was the guy that was on your show. I don't watch sports, so I don't really know his name, but the, the guy who broke down crying. Michael Beasley. I watched that clip several times because we've all felt that way. I felt that way, you know? I've not felt that way the way that he did, that deep, that expressive, because I don't let me go there. I'm like, okay, you know, but I felt that way. And that's part of what I'm working on um, too in therapy. But yeah, no, the Peter Parker thing, I, I do feel like what you see is what you get in terms of our experience, whatever energy I try to follow. But do I let my guard down with everybody and show everybody who I am all the time? Nah. With all that's going on in your life, what is the moment you point to that created the most of Jason Lee. You know, you talk about your drug addicted mother and foster care, watching your brother uh, be murdered. What was the one moment that you said, this is the way I have to be in order to cope moving forward? I always go back to credit that moment my brother died because one, I was in a gay relationship that nobody knew about because I wasn't out. So I couldn't be comforted by my boyfriend who was standing there with me, so that was one. Um, I'd never experienced pain to the point to where I couldn't even stand up anymore. You know, you see people in the movies fall out and they're crying and all that, and then you'll be like, yo, they really acting their ass up. Like that was the level of pain that that created. Um, and then afterwards, I just had this real destructive spiral where I wanted to hurt anybody who ever hurt him. And we did a lot of really nasty things to people in our community. But then I just said, you know, like, I have a choice to decide which direction I want to go. I chose to honor him and what he believed in me for my life to do more for myself. So although I was trying to get a good job, I was still drinking heavily. Uh, I was working and doing a great job, but then I was also in the streets doing stuff. Um, and then once I started getting better careers and out of the streets, I still was heavily, heavily drinking and just became an alcoholic that in my mind, I never wanted to be like my mom who was a drug addict, mm. but didn't see alcohol as a drug and I was on that shit. Right. I would work all day, drink and party all night, pass out, wake up, go to work. I was a functional. I mean, it was just a thing where it was normal. I normalized it. Coming out of that was realizing that, you know, what I fought hard to fight through with him dying or surviving all the other things I went through, man, God blessed me with an opportunity to still be here. So I have to continue to work hard to um, to be the best version of myself. So I guess for me, the wall that I put up, I mean, I put up different walls. I put up walls to keep certain people away. I put up walls to protect the things that I hold the most sacred. But there are people that I do let in and those people I've been very um, smart about and have um, protected that. You said you don't like to leave with your sexuality. Yeah. And then you just said that you were in a, a gay relationship, but you didn't, at that point you weren't out, so your boyfriend couldn't console you when your brother died. Correct. Coming out, what was the decision made when you did come out and, I don't want to say hurt your career, but could you have be farther along if people thought you were straight right now? Well, I think there's a couple of things. One, I think that I live with a veil of being straight because I'm not what people perceive as to be gay, right? Um, I don't leave with my sexuality, meaning like I didn't go into VH1 and say, I'm going to be dressed in rainbow every day with high mm -hmm. heels and makeup on in a bag and nails and all that. And that's just, cause that's just not my thing. That's just not what I'm interested in. I learned over the course of becoming famous or recognizable that I was given certain privileges that other people are not given. I was never called a faggot until what, two, three years ago, somebody tried it. And I was Jason Lee with Hollywood Unlocked to try it. He was just drunk and it became a whole thing where, you know, they fixed that real quick uh, within 24 hours. But you know, it was one of those things where like this person slipped up and said something that people in my community have endured for years that I've just never had that happen to me. I didn't want to leave with my sexuality, but I've always been proud of being who I am. And there was never really a coming out story. I never sat my family down and said, hey, by the way, I'm gay. 
because uh, I just feel like who who I have sex with or what I who I'm sexually involved with is nobody's business. And what I because I'm not walking around to people saying you straight, you straight, you straight. Oh, he's straight. There's no announcement made when straight people walk in the room. What I will say is that I think the way my family found out or actually heard the words come out of my mouth was when I was on Love and Hip Hop. That was when I first they first were sitting at their houses. And I remember I put them all in a group text, all my siblings, and I said. By the way, you're going to hear some shit tonight that's going to be hilarious. Call me if y'all have any questions. That was the text. (laughs) Boom. (laughs) So they're all watching because they watch every week. And, uh, and, you know, I had thrown the drink on somebody who had tried to out the person I was in a relationship with on television. And I knew it was coming and we're going to be in the reunion talking about it. And so I said it at the reunion. Uh, You know, I'm gay and I feel like them doing that was a way of outing somebody. And, you know, I looked at the group text and it was crickets. Nobody said anything, you know. One of my sisters, she called me, she said, you know, we love you no matter what you say or what you do. She didn't say we love you even though you're gay. Mm -hmm. Which is cool, you know, because now it's just, it is what it is. So that was just, now once it was kind of out there after the people had gotten to know me um, online and stuff through the show, I just leave with who I am. And, you know, I don't don't, um, publicize my relationships. I don't try to put everything, because I I don't want to be treated like an ornament. I don't want to be treated or not seen for my business acumen or my, my, my brilliance and how I've been able to build and create things. I want to be respected as an entrepreneur. Not to say that you can't be if you're openly gay, but that's just not what I'll choose to lead with. My cousin, uh, who I'm really close with, I was the first person that he told oh, wow. he was gay. And I felt like I always knew. Mm. And I was like, I don't care. Like, this is what it is, bro. And I didn't, I guess I didn't feel like I had to say, I love you even though you're gay, mm-hmm. because to me, he always was. Yeah. When you have the crickets on the phone afterwards, yeah. was it because they already knew, or did you feel like just at that point, it didn't really matter? I think I have such a strong personality that people oftentimes don't really know what to say. Right. Uh, because I will give you my opinion back very quickly, and I'm the same way with my family as I am with everybody else. I think that, well, one, I'm coming to Thanksgiving every year with a different pretty... Like, you should know, like... <laughs> that, but that's, but that's I my mean, point, though. But like, it's the homie. Were you really hiding it's the, it? It's the homie. But, I mean, come on. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure they knew. I had, a, I had a cousin, this is a funny story. One of my cousin's wife, she married into the family. You know, it's always the people that marry into your family that do more than your family. She would always come and say, let us pray. You know, Lord, we hope that Jason and his friend... <laughs> you know, or she would ask me, like, How, you got a girlfriend? You know, right. you know what you're doing. You right. know. Yeah. Right. But I just never... I said, no, I ain't got one. You know, I'm living my life. Me and my homies is out here hanging out, you know? And I felt like there was never a proclamation needed to be had. And I also feel like when your family know you, they know you. That's what I was You yeah. know what I mean? Like, But there were times where I did have girlfriends. Like, I've, I had girlfriends up until about 18. And then, you know, I pivoted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> when you look at what you've been able to create, yeah. which truly is, especially from a business and a branding point, absolutely phenomenal. Thank you. When you went about your business to say, this is what I want to do, this is who I am, and this is the way I'm going to go about doing it, how could you ever have envisioned it was going to be this? And now, how do you elevate it? Like you said, you want to double it this year. What's the next step in elevating your business to a point we haven't seen media of your genre be? I always knew I was gonna be great because I had a fire in me to prove to myself that I'd be great. I never do anything that feels like a job or it feels like it's not gonna be great. I've never taken on a job I wasn't passionate about. When I worked at a pizza place, I was passionate about making pizza. (laughs) I wanted to work at the pizza place. I just, I love pizza and I wanted to know how to make pizza. And I was the best pizza maker uh, for about six months. But then I got fired from that job. Um, and then I went and found every other career that I was passionate about. I was passionate about education and wanted to understand how kids of color had access to the same information as other people. And so I wanted to be in there and, and learn that. Then I wanted to work at probation because I felt like as a person who survived the streets, that what are y'all doing in there to help these kids? There needs to be people with a heart in there. And I went and understood that that, was, um, that institution is a business. So I left there in a very crazy way. They fired me because I took on the county on how they were ha- handling kids. And then when I took on the county, the union saw me and said, yo, you need to come work for the union the way you fight for people. And then I found a job that let me fight for the underdog and paid me great money to 
do that and did that for 11 years. But then I got to a point where I wanted to, I had my own dreams, my own passions, my own purpose, and I felt like I would not be able to do that working for somebody else. So in order to do that, I needed to find freedom. What was I the most passionate about? I love tech, I love the dot com, I love the social media world, I love celebrities, so I put it all together and I figured out through trial and error how to build the foundation. Once I built a solid foundation, then I started looking at the different walls. So wall one was how do I, uh, uh, build a, a podcast, a platform where I can control my voice. Wall two was how can I partner with the company to expand that and go get their audience. Wall three was what other platforms can I use like this one and I invite you on mine to share community. And then from there, like what's the next wall? What are the other temple things I can build to uh, elevate us in the branding world, in the events world, in the different spaces that exist within the ecosystem of entertainment and media? And then, you know, I started, once I built all my walls, I started saying, well, damn, I built a house, but I don't want no ceiling because there's no ceiling mm. to what I can do. I'm going to keep going, keep growing, keep collaborating, keep innovating. And so now, instead of putting the roof on what I built, we're just adding more floors to it and, and continue to elevate until that final day I do put the roof on. And that'll be when I exit and sell it to somebody and then go, you know, trot around the world and live my best life. That's funny you say that. That was my next question because you said... I got 10 years left of this. I don't know if you're joking or not. Jason, 10, 10 max. 10 max. But I, I'm, I'm hoping five to seven. I have a five to seven year exit plan right now. So yes. let's say 11 years. Let's say it's a long, the long game. At 11, 11 years from now, yeah. where are you business-wise? Where are you personal-wise? Okay. 11 years from now, I will go on record to say I will be retired from what I am doing. That is my goal. 11 years, I will be 56. Yeah, 56, 57. Um, I want to be retired from this part of the business. I want to invest. I want to create other things. I want to do philanthropy. Um, yeah, five to seven years is really my goal. And I mean, I'm working really, really hard to, to reach that goal because, you know, in many ways, this is exciting. I love what I do. And like I said, I don't want to do anything I'm not excited about. I'm still excited about it. But it, it does come with a price. When I told Floyd, I'll go back to Floyd again, who's my mentor. I called him one day and I was really excited. This big, powerful Hollywood producer who everybody knows met with me for an hour and a half to ask me questions about my business because he wanted to create a show with me. And then he took all those ideas and went and created his own show without me. But I was so excited about this meeting that I had that I called Floyd and he looked at me very disinterested and he was like, and I'm like, yo, you're not excited for me? Like, I'm telling you that. And he said, I'll be excited when you realize that you're the Floyd Mayweather of media. And if mm. you just continue to work hard and stay dedicated and, and become obsessed with what you're doing, you're going to be at the top. And and I thought I was obsessed, so I had to go back and really evaluate my obsession. And then I became obsessed. So my whole mantra now is if I'm awake, I'm working. If I'm awake, I'm working. There's no days off. There's no break. There's no, there's still a balance, of course. You know, I do know how to pace myself, but, but I'm so obsessed with the build of what I'm doing that when they did the story that we raised the money and we got a $50 million valuation, I spent one minute saying, oh my God, I'm proud of myself. And the next minute I was like, how do we get to 100? How do we get to 200? What's the $500 million mark? And then what's that billion dollar thing that's going to make this something to where the buyers come to the table and I can gracefully exit and go live my life and literally be completely done with having an opinion? What about personally? You stay on business now. That's why I'm in therapy for. Because I have that, that balance I have not figured out. Because it's really hard. Like, you know, I meet somebody and they tell me, well, I don't have the money you do. So, well, what that mean? What, the, what does that mean? You don't have the money I have. Okay, well, if that's the measuring point, then we probably should just stop talking because you're not going to catch up. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't gonna find nobody acting like that. I'll tell you now. <laughs> well, I'm gonna it's tell over my, for you, Jason. I'm gonna tell, you know what my therapist told me to do? I said, man, I think it's time to settle down. I'm gonna have a kid this year. I should probably settle down. He said, well, why don't you just go on your social media and say you're looking for a life partner? I said, that's fucking desperate. I ain't doing that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> then I joined Hinge. What they do, block me because they said it's a fake profile. I can't even join an app. So at this point, wait, a lot of athletes watch this show. Hit me in my DMs. <laughs> Slide right now. I won't say nothing. <laughs> Kelly Obrey tried to date you. You ain't got a girl. I don't know what to do. <laughs> you can put this out. Serge Ibaka is like my brother. Me and Serge and Tiffany walk in a party during Fashion Week, and I had been posting Kelly. I'm not even like the thirsty type of person like to be posting shit on my social media because I feel like that's real gay, right? <laughs> Y'all can laugh at this. Okay? <laughs> 
laughed. You all have permission to laugh yeah, at gay jokes. Appreciate it. Uh, and gay people, we need to stop being so judgmental. Like, I, we need to allow people to learn our journey. Because, you know, I see y'all be... T people are so afraid to say shit to gay people. I'm like, damn, y'all need to have... Anytime y'all have a gay edition of The Pivot, you need me to pull up, I'll ask all the gay shit. <laughs> because... Y'all not gonna learn until we have a conversation. But anyway, uh, me and Serge Tiffany, we walk in the party, and I've been posting Kelly Obre, you know, because I believe in manifestation. I, I manifest everything I have. I manifest the happiness. I manifest my business. So I said, I'm gonna manifest Kelly Obre. You know, I put him on my social media every day. I walk in this party, me and Serge are walking through it, and as soon as we walk in, I see Kelly Obre. And I go, oh shit. And Kelly turns around and he goes, hey, my look. I ain't gay. I love that you gay and I love that you love me, but not in that way. I'm cool. I love you, but I'm not with it. I said, Dan, couldn't have said hello. Like, <laughs> have said hello. But he was a good sport about it. Yeah. Uh, then he went and got in a relationship with a girlfriend. So now I'm like, fuck Kelly O'Brien. You know? <laughs> hey, you shot hey. your shot. Yeah, hey. I shot my shot. <laughs> and with that, man, that's the end of this episode of The Pigeon, though. Thank you. Appreciate you, though. Boy, you funny as hell, man. For real. Thank you. Hold up. Limitless. Take a simmer cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. On the mission, got me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust. Limitless. Take a simmer cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. On the